Here's Miata Fambula, Chief Executive of the New Economics Foundation, with her take of the week. Politicians in London, Britain's gilded capital, have spent decades hoarding wealth whilst implementing policies that have impoverished regional economies. So, was it any surprise when these communities expressed their frustration by voting for Brexit? Post-Brexit, the most important task facing politicians is how to cure regional inequality. Theresa May's cure is the Stronger Towns Fund. Some see this as a 1.6 billion bribe to convince Northern MPs to vote for the Prime Minister's lacklustre Brexit deal. But even if you take the government's policy in good faith, this is an insult to deprive local government. $1.6 billion may sound like former mining towns have struck gold, but this money will be shared between a number of areas and stretched out over seven years. It also comes at a time when local authorities will be expected to cut their spending by 37% in just one financial year. Far from containing 24 karat bullion, May's treasure chest is filled to the brim with fool's gold which may as well be nothing at all. This means that this pork barrel is just more cynical government spin. Even when conservative policies to stimulate regional economies are well-meaning, they are toothless. For instance, HS2 was billed as a massive investment in the northern economy, but with an 84% overspend, the tracks may never make it north of Birmingham. And even if they do, London will benefit more than anywhere else. The scheme should be scrapped. The money is better spent elsewhere. So how do we rebalance Britain's economy? First, local authorities need more cash and an end to austerity. Second, Britain needs a devolution revolution. Bureaucrats in Whitehall do not understand the nuances of regional economies. Thirdly, local government needs to use devolved powers to radically transform their economies. So it's time to open the vaults and spread the wealth. Before another people's revolt shakes Westminster to its core. <coughs> and thanks to Sharp's Pixley Bullion House in St. James's, Miata joins us now. Welcome to the programme. Thank you. Now, before I bring in Michael and Jess, let me just ask, what, what, explain what you mean by politicians hoarding wealth in London? So, I mean, I think it means the fact that actually what we've seen over the last 20, 30 years is more investment has flown into London uh, than has flown into other parts of the country. So if you look at the figures now and you take something like transport and investment, 2.6 times more is spent per head in London than in the north. So there's this disparity, and it's sort of, you know, understandable. That's not on a per capita basis. Per head, on a per head is basis. 2.6 times more in London than the rest of the so country. So you think that's politicians hoarding wealth? So I don't think it's politicians hoarding wealth, but I think it's them making policy in quite a London-centric way. And actually, when the people that are doing the thinking, you know, the civil servants live in London and the South East... And the media. And the media, there is this focus. You know, okay. for me, the classic example is the railways. People in London are obsessed with the railways mm -hmm. because buses work really well in London. The rest of the country, the bus system is a disaster, and yet it's never talked about in Westminster. Mm -hmm. What's your reaction, Michael? I, I think on that narrow point, I probably agree. I, I mean, you, you see the investments going on to Crossrail and that's gone into Thameslink. It's been absolutely enormous. Mm. And you just have to look at the quality of the rail services around Manchester. Just, just look at the rolling stock. It's, it, you know, it's absolutely appalling. It's out of a different age. However, where I fundamentally disagree is that I think that the high-speed rail is precisely to link the northern towns to the southeast of England. The southeast of England 
is, is just the most amazing economy. I mean, it's like a country of its own. And I really think unless the towns to the north of Britain, uh, of the southeast, are linked to the southeast by a completely reliable high-speed rail system mm -hmm. of the sort that other countries have, then the prosperity of the southeast will never be shared with the rest of the country. Well, w will the prosperity be shared, though, or will it not just suck more wealth into London? Will the Birmingham not just become a commuter belt into London? Well, I mean, that certainly is already seeming part of the problem, although I think there's, it, there's a tale of two cities, if you will, um, because where I live now, most of the houses, when people are putting their houses on the market, my friends, my family, it does seem there's a lot of people moving from London, pushing the prices up, doing some of that stuff and that we've seen in here. Quickly. But also, um, I think that what I've seen in Birmingham with the hope and of uh, HS2, just even the plans for HS2, has seen certainly the centre of Birmingham and the more affluent areas in Birmingham seen lots of investment coming in, lots of jobs. It doesn't even go to the centre of Birmingham. It, it goes I mean, out to the east of it, and then you have to go. Well, as an East Birmingham in. MP, well, let me put this I in. I bring the atta back, back that. in. <laughs> If you, I, I think the cost of HS2 just to get to Birmingham is about 50 billion, and then the, to get to Leeds and Manchester is more. Let's just take London to Birmingham. Mm -hmm. If you had 50 billion to spend, mm -hmm. and you believe that there's a need for a rebalancing in this country, mm -hmm. would it not make a lot more sense to build high-speed transport links between Leeds, Manchester, and Liverpool? Michael talks about the southeast being this wonderful labour market. That would create a labour market of the north. That would be a better spend of 50 billion. I mean, as a Birmingham MP, I'm obviously not going to agree because actually in a lot of these strategies, in between when you talk about the north and the south, I am from the great middle that often yeah, gets but I'm forgotten. You think of the country. So I, I, I would. To, let me yeah, yeah, that that So, you know, a lot of your arguments I hear, not least because for a long time I was a supporter of High Speed 2, but when you look at the cold facts, the fact that the scheme has, you know, when you compare the cost uh, back in 2013, mm. the cost now has gone up by 84%. Uh, yeah. Rail experts are suggesting that it could go anything up to right. 70 to 100 billion. And the key thing is that with that sort of cost, where the cost benefit doesn't stack up, it's not clear that the link from Birmingham up north will actually happen yeah. in the right. first place. Right, so come place. back to the, the, the point. Let's accept you're right for the sake of the argument. I'm sure Michael will say you're not. Would it not be better to spend this money, probably be cheaper as well, if we want... If you high-speed link these northern towns yeah. that I mentioned, you create a labour market almost Absolutely. as big as Greater London. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. You create a northern powerhouse. Yeah. And actually, if you a look at a northern, northern powerhouse, powerhouse, you look at other European countries, you have these economic centres. We are really unusual in having one economic centre in London and the southeast, And it skews the economy. So actually, what we should be doing, if, you're, if your priority and your purpose is rebalance the economy mm -hmm. and building the northern powerhouse, the northern economy, then we should be thinking about the infrastructure and we should be in thinking about investment in the if, north. If we're going to make the comparison with other European countries and indeed with developing country, developed countries all over the world, then all of them, that is say Germany, Italy, France, Spain, China, Japan, have built high-speed rail. They all recognise that high-speed rail yeah. is a fundamental part of a modern economy. Absolutely. We can't go on relying on a Victorian yeah, uh, infrastructure. And we would be unique if we reject, reject high-speed rail. And it's, and it's a kind of but typical... When, British arrogance. But we're not rejecting it, but it's not uh, Michael, rail, what we're, it's the scheme. It's this particular scheme. Yeah. But what we're high saying speed, is, but what's it, happening if to you've the got limited resources, you'd be better to... Because London always gets the big stuff first. Mm. But again, um, if you why got, not build it in the north and help the rebalancing? Well, the, one of the reasons why it's become so expensive is that um, the environmental lobbies have been allowed to get away with so much. I mean, so much of it is being built in tunnels, which is, no. which is going to make the... Which is going you're to make not the... addressing my point. What I'm saying is if you've got 50 billion on high-speed rail, but, instead but, of everything starting in London, is how the M1 it... started in London, the yeah. M4 started in London, the M6 started in, in London, why the not... The M6 certainly doesn't not, start not in London. Not the M6, sorry. The, a, the M40 uh, was meant to bring London to Oxford to Birmingham. Why not spend the money in the north and help the rebalancing. Well, 
I don't think that's a very strong point, I must say, because the motorway systems everywhere apart from London and the South East are much better. They're much better in Scotland, they're much better in Birmingham, much better in Manchester. That's not a very strong point. Have been on the point. M6 between <laughs> Birmingham and Manchester? It's like the worst moment of your life. But, Stuck by IKEA for hours. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, but there aren't, there aren't motorways <laughs> in London that you could even criticise. You, I mean, you fair. called, uh, Miata, you called for a, a devolution revolution as part of this. Uh, but Scotland and Wales have had their devolution revolution. Their economies aren't performing better than the UK as a whole. No, um, I would, there, it depends on the period of time that you're looking at. I mean, Scotland has seen big improvements. It's being hit at the moment um, by uh, the sort of collapse in the oil industry. But for me, the kind of key question is, if what we're trying to do is change and improve local economies, then actually the people who live there, who work there, who know their patch, are better placed to make decisions about but, how you but change the economy. The Welsh economy is not growing but, noticeably but, but faster. Not, but there, uh, there has been a lot of new devolution. There are now minis, um, oh, what, mayors. My words, yeah, mayors. mayors in so many of these cities today. And is it not the case that the mayors of those cities believe that they want to be linked to London by a high-speed, reliable railway? I mean, I, I've certainly got the impression, speaking to politicians in Manchester, that they believe it's do or die for yeah. Manchester. It must be linked by high-speed rail. So but I think there are two parts of that. I think we have seen some devolution, but it's still very much in the margin. So where you compare where we are, the powers that our mayors yeah. have, compared with other European... It's completely paltry. I don't notice the difference of us having a mayor, I have to say. And if you were to ask anyone on the streets of most of the West Midlands, they would tell you the yeah. same. You say that's true of Manchester too. Well, I have no idea. No, I don't live in Manchester, but... No, but um, you are true. You've been once or twice. I have been once or very twice. Well. But Let me come back to this. Uh, in America, you would almost call it a slush fund, the, the $1.6 yeah. billion. Now, given the size of the fund, is, is that just a sign that the gov of the government's tin year, or did it genuinely make a mistake and put the decimal point in the wrong place? <laughs> I, I really don't know, but... Just as we're paying the 39 billion to the European Union without any certainty of what we get in return, is not Mrs. May here paying 1.6 billion without any idea whether this is going to change anybody's vote? So, so my my objection to it is not so much that it's bribery, but that it's inefficient or incompetent bribery because she's not assured of getting these people to vote for her not anyway. I mean, it's made no difference, I assume. It's made absolutely no difference. In fact, I think it's been a PR disaster for her. Um, it's it's offered with such bad faith, and it it doesn't just look tinnied about the situation in Parliament with Brexit. It looks complete. It makes her look even more distant from the reality that of places like where I live well, and towns like Wigan. Right, but it it. it... It's obviously a small amount of money, and a government yeah. that spends 800 billion, 1.6 billion over seven years, mm -hmm. is not a, a lot. But it is geared to places that have missed out. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you look, there's been a huge revival of our old Victorian industrial cities: yeah. Manchester, Liverpool, Leeds, Newcastle, Glasgow. But they've actually been reviving sucked in spending and brains from the surrounding area. The real problem now are the Huddersfields, yeah. the Barnsleys, the, the Prestons, the Hulls, yeah, the Wolverhamptons. Mm -hmm. That's absolutely. what needs to be addressed. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, you look, the intention of the fund, I think, is completely well-meaning. Mm -hmm. The problem with it is when you put it in context, it is completely insignificant. So, you know, since 2013, local governments have seen their uh, budgets cut by about £13.5 half of their budget. So, you know, this £1.6 No, it doesn't compensate. ..barely compensate. Yeah, but worse right. than that, in the next financial year... Revenue support grant, so the grant that goes to lo local government that's called Revenue Support Grant, we'll is due more. to be cut by yeah. 1.3 billion okay. in one year alone. Yeah. So, you know, they're giving with one hand and taking with another. Well, I have followed regional policy since I, since I was at university mm. and studied going back to the 1930s. And we've made many attempts, and although it's had successes, it's never really seemed to make a fundamental difference to what you're talking about. So keep at it and see if you can do better. <laughs>